my message title is The Missing Ingredient. How many of you have ever cooked something and it did not turn out the way it was supposed to? Here last week, I cooked Kathy and the girls some chicken recipe that had great reviews online. Let's just say that because I was hungry, I ate all of mine, but nobody else's plate was empty. I think I got the recipe right. I just don't think that the ladies appreciated fine, the fine chef. Remember, I'll never forget this time, but Kathy and I were in uh, New Jersey. We moved from Bible college after we got married to New Jersey before we moved here. And there was, a, there was a, 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 another person on staff there. He was a single man. He was a year or two older than uh, we are. And uh, he was talking to us about how he started cooking because he wasn't a very good cook. And he says, hey, uh, I, made, I made hamburger helper tonight. And Kathy says, you know, asking, well, how did that turn out? And he goes, it, re it really wasn't that good at all. And I was like, well, how in the world did you muss up Hamburger Helper? The one he had was boil water, add some milk, and the, open the packets and pour it in. How did you mess it up? He goes, well, I didn't have any milk. And I said, so what did you do? He goes, well, milk is something I eat at breakfast, so I substituted orange juice. Just if you're not sure, not the right choice. The right ingredient is so important to making the recipe work. And guess what? God gives us a recipe to make our walk with him work the way it's supposed to work. See, we share an incredible message, an incredible message of forgiveness, of love, of restoration, of healing. We are blessed beyond blessed. How many of you are blessed? It is amazing the message that we have the opportunity of sharing and living in our lives. But yet there's something that's missing in our churches across America that brings us to a place where the world doesn't see the Christ that we represent. Gandhi said this. He says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. The representation that we give of who the Christ is is sometimes very discouraging, I'm sure, to God. See, we don't need more religious people in this world. We need more transformed people in this world. See, the first century church turned the world upside down. They saw miracles. They saw the power of God. Governments were nervous and put preachers into jail because the power of God that was moving, and they saw such an incredible move of God. But now my concern is that in America, our church is in a state, in a very powerless state, and it's propelled or fueled by a lack of Christian standard, convictions, morals, word, and a lack of prayer. We become more concerned with political correctness than we have about biblical correctness. We don't need more people who will amen the preacher on Sunday and compromise their religious faith on Monday. And so you guys are getting really quiet really fast. Look, i got to preach fast because I believe God wants to do something in your life tonight, and I don't want you to be looking at the clock worrying about what time it is. Okay? And so I'm just going to jump in deep. Can you go deep with me quick? Can you handle it? All right. Some of you need to smile a little bit, though. You make me nervous. And how's the hope? I think they just laugh at me because they're like, <laughs> <laughs> I just choose to take it the way I want to. But there's a passage in Acts chapter 9 that I think really begins to sum up what the missing ingredient is. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bible to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. And it says this, as you turn there, and I'm going to read it on the screen, but it says this. It says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and were in the, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. I read that passage and I think, isn't that what we want to see every Sunday in every believer's life? People who are full of peace because life is good. They are strengthened. They're edified. Every day is a little bit better than the day before. They're encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They got joy on the inside. They're seeing growth not only in their personal walk, but they're also seeing growth is numerically as other people are coming to know Christ. And I believe that the growth and the things that happened were because of that missing ingredient, which I believe it's because so many people don't live in the fear of the Lord. They don't live in the fear of the Lord because they don't have a revelation of who God really is. 
They don't have a revelation of how incredible God really is. His love, his grace, his mercy, but there's so much. And I believe that's the missing ingredient tonight that we're going to spend the next few moments looking at is, God, do I live in that place of the fear of the Lord? I want to read a quick uh, definition that I, that I read out of Institute in, in Bible, Basic Bible Principles where it says the fear of the Lord defined can be defined as a continual awareness that you are in the presence of a holy, just, and almighty God and that every motive, thought, word, and action is open before him and will be judged by him. I believe it is that place of awe and that place of respect when you're in his presence. It's the knowledge or revelation of God himself. When you fear God and you've decided that knowing who God is is more important than anything else in life. Unfortunately, we come to that place across America where people don't care to know God more. They just want to know him enough to have a relationship with him. I remember when Kathy and I met, we met about 27 years ago, maybe 28 years ago now, and we were in Bible college, and uh, when we first met, we didn't like each other. It's true, we didn't. I was not interested in her, and she was not interested in me whatsoever. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. you can't figure it out, I'll draw a picture up here later on for you. It did work. But we ran with different crowds. You guys know what I'm talking about? We had different friend groups. And not that I thought anything bad about her. I don't know what she thought about me, whether it was bad or not. But we found ourselves in philosophy class. Philosophy class was one of those classes that uh, we just kind of sat in the back and passed notes. Anybody else remember passing notes before in school? For all you people over or under 40, it's not a text. We actually wrote things on an actual piece of paper, and we would actually hand them back and forth. We went on a couple study sessions. I found out she wasn't so bad. I found out she wasn't near as bad as I thought she was. The more I got to know her, the more I found that I liked her. I don't know why she said yes to me. But I know that the more revelation or understanding of the character of the woman I was spending time with, the more attractive she became in my life. The same thing I believe happens in our walk with God, that the more time you spend with him, the more you're going to fall in love with him. The more you find out how amazing he is, the more you're going to want to spend time in his presence. The more time that you spend in his presence, the more you're going to want to read about him. And it's just this revolving cycle of getting to know God better. And the more you know him, the more he's going to change your life. And so we're going to look quickly at a few, three quick points today. First of all, you need to understand God's character. You need to know who God is. You really do. There is not enough time for us tonight to be able to totally explore the character of God. But first of all, God is a God of love. You know, in our society, everybody wants to make God look like he's some, some bigot. They want him to make look like he's homophobic. They want to make God look like he's angry. They want to look God, make God look like he doesn't care about people. But that is contrary to what the word of God says. Jesus came and he died on the cross for every single person, no matter what walk of life they're in. But it was nothing short of love that motivated him. He's a loving God. He's a saving God. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. He's a saving God. I want you to think of where you'd be if it wasn't for God's saving grace in your life. You'd be a mess. I'd be a wreck. He is a saving, loving God. But he's also something that most people don't want to look at. He's also a God of judgment. He's also a God of judgment. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, you know what, one day we're going to face judgment for the things we do. Boy, this is when you expect a lot of amens. There you go. <laughs> but let me tell you about judgment. There's two kinds of judgment. There's good judgment and there's bad judgment. Most people are scared of judgment because they think it's all going to be bad. I'm looking forward to judgment because I think I got something good coming my way because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Heaven is real. 
God has got a place for you that is intended for you to dwell with him forever. A person place uh, that is no more pain, no more suffering. There's nothing else wrong there. You're not going to have to worry about anything. You're not going to be stressed. You're going to be in the presence of God. It's, it's all going to be good. And we look forward to that and we say, oh God, thank you for that. But then on the flip side of that, that means if heaven is real, then hell has to be real too. Hell wasn't created for us. Who was hell created for? Satan and his demons. It's a place of destruction. It's a place of death. It's a place of torture. And God wants us to remember that there is a reality of heaven and there is a reality of hell. Anybody ever been to a hellfire brimstone service before? You know, one of those ones where every week you went to church and you're like, I'm getting saved. I don't know why, but I sure am scared that I'm going to hell. I remember going to a service one time, and I and I I rededicated my life to the Lord just because I wasn't a hundred percent sure, and I, and I was in Bible college. I wanted to be sure. This guy was sending everybody that was called into ministry straight to the pit, and we better repent. And I just wanted to be sure. But see, God has something good in store for you. The problem is, is that we have taken the awe and the wonder and the majesty of who God is, and we have made him so common that we forget how awesome our God is. We forget how amazing our Heavenly Father is, and we treat him more like a buffet God than we do like a, a, a loving God who is real. What do I think of a buffet God? That's where you get to pick and choose what you like. How many of you love buffets? There's only one buffet I really like. That's Jay's Fried Chicken. I only go there like once every couple months. Pastor Allen puts it on the men's lunch menu if he feels like being benevolent to me when I come down to visit for the men's group that goes out to eat in Sykes and on Thursday. But when I go through that buffet, I know exactly where I'm going. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mashed potatoes. Gravy. You know what else I'm getting? Fried chicken. I'm not eating lizards or gizzards, either one of them. I'm not stopping at that fried stu- that part of it at all. I'm going straight for the, for the chicken parts that I believe God blessed and said were good. If I feel guilty like I should eat vegetable, uh, if I should eat a vegetable, I will grab one cooked carrot and put it on my plate. And if I feel like vegetables should be plural, I will add a green bean to that plate at the same time. It's true. It's true. But I know what I want. I'm going to fill up on the things that I like while I'm there. You take me to a Chinese food buffet, and it is a totally different picture. I get to the Chinese buffet, and I'm like, God, what won't make me sick? God, give me discernment from the Holy Spirit. I pray and I say, but Jesus, you know I'm allergic to cats, and I did not take Benadryl before this lunch. And I'm being selective, and I'm picking, and I'm choosing what I want off the buffet. If you want to send me a hateful email, you can send it to cfisher at kfirst.org. Funnel it through my secretary. He'll get it right to me. I'm sorry, Chad. <laughs> okay, I'm not sorry at all, Pastor Chad. He picks on me all the time, almost takes me to tears. <laughs> but many times we get this image of God that says, just like going through a buffet, say, you know what, God, I'm not sure I really agree with you on this whole holiness thing. God, I'm not really sure that I want to grab a hold of the fact that maybe I need to be careful about the things that I put in my spirit and in my life. Maybe if they're cussing, if they're carrying on, if it's inappropriate, then maybe I shouldn't be taking that in no matter how old I am. Because what I fill my spirit with is going to begin to come out in my life in some time or some fashion. It gets you to that place where you say, God, I'm just going to be obedient to you no matter what you tell me to do whether I agree or whether I disagree. It's that place in your life where you say, God, I'm not going to choose and pick out the things that you say are good for me. I'm taking the whole package. When Kathy and I got married, she got some surprises when she got me. 
I mean, just, I mean, it's true. She didn't know that I was OCD. And if I got up, the first thing I had to do was take a shower, even if I was going to go mow the grass. And then I would take a shower after I mow the grass. She thinks that's weird. Don't even sigh with her, Pastor Chad. <laughs> she found out things about my family she didn't know. She thinks, found out things about me she didn't know. But the longer we were together, the more she got revelation of who I was, whether she wanted it or not. I think she got a whole lot of surprises. You guys are just going to get out of control, aren't you? I have no problem putting you in timeout. I, uh, yeah, well, it's Super Wednesday. We got discipline room. You go to the red chair first, and if you still can't pull it together, you go to the discipline room. And uh, <laughs> the only problem, if I send Pastor Chad to the discipline room, he's going to take his Bible with him. He's just going to go straight to his truck, and so I'm not going to let him do that. But there's all these revelations that keep coming through time because anybody else get married and did not know exactly what you were getting into? Just Kathy? Just Kathy. She was perfect. I didn't have to do anything. But here's the way it comes down to. We do the same thing with God. We make a commitment to Christ, then we find out there's more to him than what we maybe originally thought. But when I took Christ, I took the whole package deal. When I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I said, okay, I guess I'm all in. No matter what this looks like, I'm all the way in. I'm going to love you. I'm going to serve you, even if it doesn't always, it didn't always make sense to me. I remember the first time I went to a church where they raised their hands. Anybody else ever get freaked out the first time you went to a church where they raised their hand? I was brought up in mainline denominational churches as a kid. First time somebody clapped in church, I was convinced somebody dropped the offering plate just like it was in the lunchroom in the cafeteria at school. Somebody did something funny, and we should be clapping. And I was like, what's going on? God is a God that deserves our honor, and he deserves our respect. Yet we make those things so common in our life and miss out what he has because there's actually benefits of fearing the Lord. Here's some benefits. It's the beginning of wisdom, according to Psalm 111, verse 10. It's the beginning of knowledge in Proverbs 1.7. It says you'll live longer in Proverbs 10, 27. It'll improve your confidence in Proverbs 14, 26. It'll rescue you from the snares and provide the fountain of life in Proverbs 14, 27. In Proverbs 16, 6, it says it'll keep us from evil. In Proverbs 19, 23, it says it leads us to life. It leads us to riches and honor in Proverbs 22, verse 4. See, what you've got to understand is, is that God loves to take care of his children and he loves to honor those that honor him. And he wants to bring blessings in our life. But we've got to keep up with what God wants to do in our life and say, God, I need to learn to fear you. Which brings us to the third and final point, that we need to learn to fear the Lord. David actually said this. Some of you are thinking, well, what do I do? How do, how do I fear God? David actually says this in Psalm, chapter, excuse me, Psalm 34, verse 11 through 22. He says, come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Verse 12. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Verse 16, the face of the Lord uh, is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Verse 17 says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Verse 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, the, excuse me, will slay the wicked foes of the and the righteous will be condemned, but the Lord redeems his servants, and no one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. What is he calling us to? A time of revelation and saying, God, I need to know you more. God, I need to spend more time in your presence. A time of obedience. But also a time where we say, you know what? I got to knock off the sin that's going on in my life. The Bible calls us out to be different. 
we shouldn't be confused with what the world is doing. They should be able to see something different in our lives as children of the Most High God that they say, I don't know what it is, and you don't have to preach it. You can just live it, and they'll be able to see something's different. You proclaim your faith through your actions where people are able to see that you are someone who pursues holiness, someone who pursues righteousness, someone who reads their Bible and says, you know what, if the Bible says it's wrong, then it's just wrong. Because in our desire for political correctness, many have gotten a long way from the scriptural correctness of what God calls us to be. It is so important for us to remember and to be able to look back and say, God, what do you want to do? It was so important in the time of Moses that in Deuteronomy 31 you can read where Moses said when we're coming together every seven years, we're going we're gonna to teach the children to fear the Lord. We're going to read all this to the people so they will have an understanding of who God really is and how amazing he is in our lives. Abraham, when he had drawn the sword, it was out of this morning's message in Genesis 22 to kill Isaac, the angel of the Lord said to him, he said, now I know that you fear the Lord because you were willing to obey even in the toughest of situations. The midwives in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, saved, that, saved Moses' life because the Bible says they feared the Lord. King Uzziah, who reigned for 52 years, became king at 16 years old. It says that when he was fearing the Lord, he was blessed. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 5, Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear the Lord. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. But yet later on in life, he began to wander away from those things. We don't know when Zechariah left the picture. But it was all summed up. And every one of those kings, just like it will be of us, either did what was right in the eyes of the Lord or they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. God wants to bring us to a place of blessing. He wants to bring us to a place where we're effective, where the power of God is moving in our lives just like it was in Acts chapter 9 that we read earlier as we began our message tonight, that you look at it and say, God, I want to see your power move. I want to see people's lives changed. I want God to say about me at the end of the chronicle of my life and say that Blake did what was good and pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. I would want someone to be able to stand up in front of a, a church or a room full of people and say that he feared the Lord and that, God, that God's place in his life was of priority, that it was important to him to live a Christian walk that maintained standards of righteousness and standards of holiness. See, what I believe what's happening across America right now is there's so many people that are pursuing God and God is not able to bless it because of the fact that so many places have compromised the message so far that God's looking at it going, man, I just don't know. I love them, but I don't know if I can put my stamp of approval on what they're doing. And I think God's looking for people to step up and say, we're going to fear the Lord. We're going to be in a place of awe and respect of how good he is. We're going to be able to understand that he's a powerful, mighty God and that heaven is real and hell is real, that he's a loving God, yet he's also our judge. But he's, but he's our healer at the same time. He's the perfect, complete package, a God who's meant to be honored and revered. I want to read this last passage to you as I wrap up in 1 Samuel 12, verse 13 through 15. It says, and Samuel is saying this, and he says, Now here's the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. Now, verse 14, he says, If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. I want God's hand to be on me and for me because of the fact that I've pushed into his presence that I look at how amazing our Heavenly Father is, and I don't take for granted the things that He's done in my life. That holiness is never seen as a bad word. That living beyond and above reproach, being a person of integrity and character, is something that's important in my life. So that God has a vessel that He can work through. God wants that for you. That his blessing and his hand will be on your life as we get to that place where we just cry out and say, God, 
Maybe I need to get some stuff right. Jamin, if you would, we're just, we're just going to wrap these last few minutes up a little differently than we have with our other second Sunday services. We move the prayer time to be able to pray for people's needs up in the service because it's important and we wanted to do that. But I believe God wants to bring us to a place of repentance tonight. The word declares that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. What's God got in store? They'll hear from heaven and they'll hear their land. What's your land look like? Does your land look like brokenness? Does your land look like a family that needs restoration? Is your, is your land just starting out? Maybe you are broken and needing healing or restoration in your life. But I know this, that when we repent and we say, God, if there's anything inside of us that's not pleasing to you, we draw the attention of the Almighty God. Faith gets the attention of God. But I also believe that repentance gets the attention of the Almighty God. Because we are surrendering ourselves and humbling ourselves before God and saying, God, I surrender to what you have in store for me. I surrender. There was a st statistic that came out years ago that said 60% of the church is living in sin and no one knows it. 20% admitted to living in sin and it was so rampant in their life that everyone around them knew what was going on. While only 20% actually confessed themselves that they felt like they were living a victorious Christian walk. What does that say to me as a pastor? There's sin in our lives, but God sent his son so that we could have victory over it. We just got to step out and do our part. And so tonight, I'm just going to ask you to bow your head. And I'm going to ask you to pray the gutsiest prayer you'll ever pray in your life. And that is just to simply say to God, God, if there's anything inside of me that's not right, I ask you to show me right now. God, if there's any one of my attitudes, any one of my words, anything that I do that doesn't bring honor and pleasure to you, reveal it to me right now. God, if there's anything in my life that you look at and say, mm, man, it's not right. Because God doesn't reveal a need for, for repentance in our life to beat us up, to make us feel bad. He does it because he loves us enough that he's saying, if you'll take care of this, I'm going to bring victory in this in your life. It always comes with the promise.